Hi. My name is Mary, and I'm an exchange student from the University of Essex. But if you've already read the brochure, then you probably already know that. So I'm not going to bore you with a long introduction. And now to start, I want to ask you all a simple question. Who here has a job? You can just raise your hands, wave them, wave them. Yeah, some of you are looking at me a bit confused. And a lot of you as students, you're like, I'm living this budget student life, so don't even ask me. And you're probably thinking, why am I asking this question? You'll find out a little bit later. Now, as I was doing some research for this talk, I found that most of the countries with the highest rates of suicide are developing countries. And that's largely due to economic, political, religious struggles and constraints. And so I looked up the World Happiness Report of 2017, and I found that Hong Kong ranked 71 out of 155 countries. That means, according to this report, Hong Kong sits in the top half, the top 45% of the world's happiest countries. Now, that sounds amazing, right? Sounds cool, isn't it? Woo! Come on, clap! Woo! <laughs> I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but everything is not okay. <laughs> everything is not all right. I challenge the notion of the World Happiness Report because although Hong Kong has a high GDP, religious freedom, a Bill of Rights ordinance, that doesn't mean everything is okay. People aren't necessarily happy, but more specifically, students are not happy. According to the World Health Organization, Hong Kong sits in the top half of the world's jurisdictions with the highest amount of suicide per 100,000. So I don't know about you, but it's a bit ironic, right? It completely contrasts the notion of Hong Kong being the world's happiest country. And according to the Research Institute for Suicide Prevention, they estimate that the amount of suicides of young people aged between 15 to 24 is at 8.9 per 100,000, and this is an increase from 8.4 in 2015. Now, what are these figures trying to tell us? What are they trying to say? They are trying to tell us that student suicide is an issue that needs to be re-examined. It seems like this sense of identity, this sense of community has been lost. And this issue is, is so grave, but it seems like society has become numb desensitized to this phenomenon, but we cannot simply brush it underneath the carpet. We can't ignore it. Something needs to happen. According to an article in the South China, the South China Morning Post, half, half of Hong Kong secondary school students were dealing with depression when this survey was done, and over a quarter considered suicide. Now, just just think about that for a moment. <laughs> With a ratio that high, that person could be your brother. That person could be your sister or someone, someone else you know, someone else younger in your family, in your surroundings. And <laughs> I don't know about you, but that's a bit scary. It is pretty scary. And now I'm going to tell you a really embarrassing story. Really, really embarrassing. So, yeah, have mercy on me. <laughs> So for us females, all the women in the house, it was that time of the month. Hmm. You know it's a struggle. <laughs> for some of us, it's really hard. We don't even want to move. That day, I wanted to watch Netflix in my bed. But I couldn't do that because I had an online deadline submission. I had work that I had to do. And what was my fortune? My laptop was broken, so I couldn't even stay inside. I had to go to the, to the learning garden. I had to go and do my work. And I was there doing my work, doing my work. I was tired, got some crackers from the vending machine, doing my work, doing my work. And I was feeling a bit dizzy. I was feeling a bit nauseous. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go to the bathroom because I'm not feeling good. So I took one step. I took another step. <laughs> and I took the third step and it all came out. <laughs> I threw up in front of everyone in the learning garden. And that's not even the worst part. I ran up to the toilet, I ran up to the bathroom. I looked in the mirror and I had a beard. And what was my beard? It was my regurgitated breakfast. So I had been walking through the library looking like a zombie, like. <laughs> and I came back down and it looked like there had been an alien abduction because no one was there, just the sick on the floor. <laughs> 
And you're probably thinking, why would she tell such an embarrassing story? Why? The sad reality, the sad fact was that no one, not one person asked me how I was doing. Not even a member of staff asked, are you okay? And I thought to myself, wow, why are these people so cold? Wow. Now, what if we projected those secondary school statistics to this university setting? What if I was part of that half who was dealing with depression? Now, what, now even worse, what if I was part of that quarter who was considering suicide? No one would know because no one cared. No one took the time to ask. And this is what's happening today in Hong Kong. This is the mentality that students themselves have towards student suicide, isolate, isolating themselves from the cases, from the people, blaming parents, even though they do play a critical part, blaming the government, and even worse, labeling the individuals themselves as weak, weird, an outsider, or whatever words you want to find. And with this in mind, isolating themselves, they see it as it has nothing to do with me, not my responsibility, but hmm. Newsflash, you are totally wrong. It has everything to do with us. It has everything to do with you because our inaction is a disease and it's contagious. We are breeding a generation of selfish people with no courage to help others. And the official terminology is called the bystander effect. Popularized by social psychologists Bib Latane and John Darley, the bystander effect occurs when the presence of others discourages an individual from intervening in an emergency situation. The perceived diffusion of responsibility deters an individual from taking an action to help. And this is what is happening in Hong Kong. This is so prevalent. And you may think, wow, this is sad. But there is hope. We can find that sense of community. We do, we do have something inside of us that we can do to change this. And being your neighbor's keeper is exactly that. Being your neighbor's keeper not only benefits the receiver of support, but it also benefits you yourself. According to a neurobiological study done by the University of California, being your neighbor's keeper, giving someone support has great, great benefits for the brain. And now I'm going to give you those benefits. So it, it helps with reducing stress in the amygdala. And you may think, what's the amygdala? This area is responsible for emotions such as fear, anger, anxiety. And when you give someone support, this area of the brain reduces the negative emotions that it emits. How amazing. And it also helps with reward-related activity in the ventral striatum. And you think, OK, what's that? It relates to re resolving issues, decision-making, and risk. And when you help someone, it stimulates a sense of reward in your mind and motivates you to help someone again. Amazing, again. And also, in the septal area, this area deals with pleasure and also anger suppression. So when you help someone else, it stimulates a sense of pleasure in you. You have that motivation to help. It's pleasing and you feel like caring because your brain has pleasure from doing it and it motivates you to do it again. So can I say, wow, who knew that being your neighbor's keeper could have so many benefits? Come on, who knew? <laughs> now I'm going to tell you a story about a girl called X around primary school age, really, really young, and for confidentiality reasons, we're gonna call her X. And this girl was in primary school, as I said. You know, she was bullied a lot. She dealt with hardships in her childhood that also led her to being suicidal. Every single day was a challenge. It was a battle to keep going, and she just felt like she wasn't pretty enough like she wasn't good enough. She was chirpy in class, but that was just to mask the, the turbulence that she was holding inside. 
I imagine at such a young age, primary school age, she didn't know how to deal with the emotional issues inside. She didn't know what to do. So she said, okay, one day, I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to take my life because I don't have the strength anymore. I just don't want to fight. So she put on a thick jacket because she was scared. She was really scared, but she was ready to die. She had the knife in her hand. She, she had the knife in her hand, and she was ready, so ready to go. But fortunately, someone took that knife out of her hand. And now you're wondering, what happened to X? Finish the story. Okay, so I will. X met loads of people, encountered loads of different people, and sometimes that was one random act of altruism, one random act of kindness, and some of them ended up being long-lasting relationships, but each of those people that she encountered were her keeper. Each of those people impacted her in some way and form, and now she, she has endless reasons to live, endless. And she loves helping people because she knows how it is to be in that dark place, and she doesn't want to be there anymore. She doesn't want anyone else to be there. And wow, isn't that amazing? The power of being our neighbor's keeper. Isn't that amazing, guys? Come on. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Come on. It's amazing. All the benefits to the brain and everything. Now, what if I were to tell you that I am X? What if I were to tell you that that girl was me? And now you understand why I'm so passionate about this issue. So I urge you, I encourage you to be your neighbor's keeper, to not keep silent. If you see a friend or someone around you feeling down, feeling weak, feeling a bit low, don't keep it to yourself. Refer them to someone who could help, maybe the wellness and counseling department. Do something, but do not be a bystander. And do not underestimate the power that you have. Being your neighbor's keeper, you can turn someone's day around, but more so, you can save someone's life. So right now, I want you to turn to the person on your left and say, you're my neighbor. Come on, guys. <laughs> now, I want you to turn to the person on your right and say, you're my neighbor. <laughs> and now you may think, <laughs> now you may think, OK, I got my neighbors, I got my neighbors. But what about myself? What about me? You. Also, if you're feeling down, if you have any issues that maybe you're dealing with inside and you don't know what to do, don't keep quiet. Find someone you can trust in, someone you can confide in and speak up because you are much more than a statistic, let me tell you. You are much more than your GPA and your grades. You have a purpose in this world, let me tell you that, if no one else has told you. And so, I want you to repeat after me. I'm special. I'm special. My life is worth living. And I am my keeper. And I am my keeper. Thank you.